Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry. I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, today's video came recommended and has a lot of views because it has 11 million over the past three years. And this is called Five Reasons You Shouldn't Mess with the USA. This is by a channel called Destiny. So in case you were thinking of messing with the US, you might want to wait until you see this video. All right, the original video link is down below. Make sure you support it. All right, we'll check this out and I'll add my commentary on the way. All right, you saw I'm all geared up. I'm ready to go. We'll see what they got. What's reason one? The collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 90s left the United States as the sole superpower in the world, and it's never looked back. Do you think that's the case? Do you think that's the case? I mean, definitely after 91, but you think now in 2023, you say the US is the only superpower? Did you put like China in there? What do you think? In all aspects of the world, the United States is indeed a superpower especially when it comes to its military might, which is unsurpassable in its strength, technological superiority, operational capabilities, and power projection across the globe. In this- Yeah, I'd say the superpower thing really merged out of World War II, with the US and Soviet Union being those two superpowers, really the ones that have any influence left now that the World War II is over. Video. We'll take a look at the five top reasons Ooh. why you wouldn't want to go against the this US military scary, establishment. Huh? Nukes. The United States Air Force is the strongest in the world, not only in the number of operational aircraft, but also in technological superiority. Yeah, there's a lot of tech. The country currently operates a total of over 15,000 military aircraft, combining all the branches of the military service, including the U.S. Navy, U.S. Army, Coast Guard, and the U.S. Marines. The U.S. can get anywhere within like two hours. Like when it comes to air travel, there's a there's an aircraft carrier somewhere in the ocean. There's bases all over the planet. You can get anywhere. As of 2017, the U.S. Air Force alone has a fleet of over 5,300 aircraft, 406 intercontinental ballistic missiles, and 170 military satellites, greater than any other country in the world. Yeah, it's not even close. The USA has the largest number of stealth aircraft designed to be silent killers and I thought those were cool by the radar kid. defense systems of most countries in the world. Some of these stealth aircraft include air superiority fighters, such as the F-22 Raptor and the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, heavy bombers, such as the B-2 Spirit. In fact, the United States pioneered this technology in the 1980s with the introduction of the F-117 Nighthawk stealth attack aircraft. Stealth aircraft- I had a little, little like toy of that when I was a kid, I remember. It was always like designed to avoid detection using a variety of technologies that reduce radar reflection from ground, sea, or air-based radar antennas, thereby reducing its radar cross-section or RCS. There's a lot better jets now. This though. revolutionary technology allows a fifth-generation aircraft such as the F-22 Raptor with a max takeoff weight of 83,500 pounds to have a radar cross-section of just 0 0.0001 meters squared, about the size of a bumblebee. What's more insane is that the massive B-2 bomber also has the same radar cross-section as the F-22 Raptor. Thus, it becomes extremely difficult to track stealth aircraft. Even if the enemy spots them on their radar scopes, it's a whole other story to successfully track them and register a missile kill. The whole idea behind this technology is to break the chain in which a conventional surface-to-air missile defense system works. It's the same reason countries like China and Russia are also hard at developing their own stealth fighter, yeah. the Chengdu J-20 well, and the Sukhoi Su-57, these, these ones are good, really good, too, though. These aircraft will allow the U.S. Air Force to assert its air superiority over any battlefield of the future. And we all know that control of these skies is the biggest decider in any war. The next... Especially, yeah, World War II showed that with the innovation, um, you know, not with World War One because it was such in its such its infancy, but World War II definitely showed that superiority in the air. And then wars after that, especially when you're not talking about superpower versus superpower, those that have the aerial advantage could can, you know, <laughs> inflict a lot of damage. Doesn't always necessarily mean you could win. Um, look at something like Vietnam where there was insane amounts of bombing, but like there's still, it's not necessarily going to lead to regime change or stuff like that. It can um, be, I mean, useful when you're you're fighting a, tr uh, a a traditional force where you know what to hit. Otherwise, you end up hitting, you know, civilians and, and that kind of thing. But yeah, like when you control the air, you control a lot. Um, something I was going to ask, if you are not an American and you're watching this video, what is your impression of the American military? Is it just like overkill? You know, is it? 
impressive? What do, you, what do you think? Let me know down below. The reason why any country going to war with the US military should think twice is because of the strength of the US Navy and its dominance over the world's ocean, yeah, especially the tanks. Navy's supercarriers. The US Navy currently operates 11 nuclear-powered Nimitz-class supercarriers, All over which the is the world. largest aircraft carrier fleet in the world. The only Navy that can come close in terms of technological advancement is probably the Royal Navy of the United Kingdom, but they only have two operational carriers. Japan had that um, until World War II, and now their uh, military is so limited by their treaty with the United States. The Nimitz class of carriers has a displacement of over 100,000 tons and can carry a complement of up to 70 aircraft. Isn't it amazing that stuff like that? A floating float. small town in the ocean with its own airport. The Nimitz class carriers so impressive to see those are extremely potent offensive weapons. Take off but the land. way they operate in what is called the carrier strike groups makes these ships even more deadly. A carrier seldom deploys alone. There are always a oh, fleet yeah. of surface and underwater assets surrounding them, Can't have that forming anymore. a strike group. It's got its own army, its own navy around it. Because look at it, you know, bigger, slower, vulnerable. If you didn't have that, like if you could actually get to the actual carrier, that'd be pretty impressive. But you got to go through a whole navy just to get through that. These include guided missile cruisers, a destroyer squadron, attack submarines, and other support vessels. Together, they project the power of the carrier and at the center of the group forward towards the enemy. While the carrier is carrying out its offensive role with the use of its air wing, the other ships are responsible to protect its flanks against any enemy attack. This combination of offensive and defensive strategy makes the US carrier strike group almost impenetrable. That's what I was gonna the say. United what States do do? Navy maintains nine such carrier strike groups, eight of which are based in the United States and one that's forward deployed to Japan. For over 50 years, this has been the principal element of US power protection and the Nimitz class of supercarriers are at the center of it all. Despite this, the US is currently in the process of developing a new class of carriers called the Gerald R. Ford class intended to replace the Nimitz class ships. What's the difference? This new supercarrier will be even more technologically advanced and is expected to continue like US dominance of the oceans well into the late What's 21st it got century. Going for it? The third reason why you shouldn't fight the US. Anyone know about that? What's it got going for it? Just defense, uh, surveillance, is it faster? Maybe a little bit of everything. Interested to know that. Okay, so we got air superiority. They got the aircraft carriers um, with that. Probably going to get some boots on the ground stuff. This military is their massive stockpile of nuclear and conventional intercontinental ballistic missiles or ICBMs. The ICBM plays the role of the land leg in the US nuclear triad, along with the Trident submarine launched ballistic missile SLBM and nuclear warheads carried on long range strategic bombers. You know, it was one thing when nuclear bombs were invented and, you know, and used, but then it, it was another level when it was. ICBMs being developed again, a rocket that could go basically, you know, to any part of the planet, right? Because in those early years, you know, during much of the Cold War, it was like to drop, you know, or to use an atomic weapon, you had to, you know, be able to fly planes and you had you had limited range and all that stuff. But now, once ICBMs came onto the scene, you get that around the 80s and stuff, you, you, it totally changed it because it now meant everywhere in the world is vulnerable to an attack. And you might be like, well, you shoot them down and all that. But like, Still, there's such a high number that, you know, it doesn't it, it takes one to slip through, right, for it to cause never ending damage. ICBMs are launched from ground based missile silos, achieving high suborbital space flight, approximately 1000 miles yeah, above the surface goes of the into Earth. space. The body of the missile then separates from the warhead, which re enters the atmosphere and free falls to the assigned target at hypersonic speeds. By the way, if you haven't heard of the the, uh, under the Reagan years, they had the uh, Star Wars idea for a, a military plan that put satellites and stuff into space that could shoot stuff down from space, like militarizing space, which would be, a, you know, a counter potentially to ICBMs. And a lot of it went, was kind of fantasy to think that would happen, but it was a great scare, scare tactic. But it was a legitimate thing that was being talked about. My dad, I mentioned this in a video not not too long ago, um, worked in semiconductors and they actually were working on semiconductors designed for like like the satellites and stuff and and whatever weaponry they were going to use in space as part of Star Wars. It's like a real thing. It never came to fruition, but the simple fact that it was being talked about and 
you know, maybe uh, 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 like attempted was was enough to to scare. <laughs> The US military currently operates 400 ICBMs from its base in Wyoming, Montana, and North Dakota. The LGM 30G Minuteman III is the only type of ICBM that is currently operational in the US. The Minuteman mm. III family of ICBMs were first developed in the 1960s as a response to the Soviet nuclear threat. Throughout the Cold War and beyond, these missiles have undergone constant modernization. In the last decade alone, the US military has undertaken $7 billion worth of upgrades. The rocket propulsion the engines, money behind the propellants stuff, used, man. the guidance system, and even the flight control surfaces have all been refurbished. The upgraded missiles are completely different from its 1960s mm. counterparts, except for the shell. These state-of-the-art improvements and good. modernization programs have kept the Minuteman III system operational for over 50 years with improved reliability that supports the missile's remarkable 99% alert rate. The latest Jeez. versions of the missiles have a range of over 8,000 miles, which is greater than the diameter of the Earth Anywhere. at 7,917.5 oh, miles. The design. They can carry multiple 330 kiloton nuclear warheads, which is 20 times greater than the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Thing is, there's bombs way bigger than that. They're just more devastating than that. It's just hard to make them from ICBMs, right? When you see those hydrogen bombs and stuff uh, that you saw tested even back in the 50s and stuff, um, not as practical, but nevertheless, the technology is there to make way bigger ones. But again, what use potential, well, shouldn't say that but like what use is is a weapon like that if you don't have the accuracy which those icbms uh, are very accurate with not only that, understand each of these warheads can be assigned to different targets independently the technology is called multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle or mirv and was first developed for the minuteman 3 family of missiles so any country messing with the united states will have to deal with this awesome arsenal of firepower which can be launched at a moment's notice. If it weren't the ICBMs or the stealth fighters raining Number fire four. down on you, it would be precision guided munitions, or better known as smart bombs or okay. PGMs instead. Um, what, what do you guys think is the the role going forward for nuclear weapons? Do you think they're far more, you know, as the future goes on, are going to be more of a deterrent to warfare or become more and more like, like of an option. Like, what do you think it's, do you think we're going to be more likely in the future to use them or less likely to use them in the future? I, I've brought this up on my channel. I bring it up in class all the time. It's like, you know, we haven't had anything as widespread as world war two, you know, a, a war that big, we've had plenty of wars, but like, do, do you think the role of that atomic weapons exist is keeping large countries from destroying each other? Do you, do you think that's the case? What, what do you think about that? Let me know down below. This is another big reason why not messing with the US military is a good idea. All branches of the US military use smart bombs in some forms or the other. These weapon systems are designed to be precise and hit a specific target with maximum efficiency. These bombs are so smart effective bombs. that during the first Gulf War, yeah, we see PGMs now. comprised only 9% of weapons fired, but accounted for 75% of all successful hits. Since then, the for the US military at least, uh, the days of normal artillery shells and unguided bombs are long gone. Nowadays, the military uses PGMs from air, ground, and sea. Precision guided munitions come in various forms and use different kinds of technologies to achieve precise hits. A large majority of PGMs use the Global Positioning System, or GPS, of satellites to guide their trajectory to target. However, sometimes this becomes a problem, as GPS coverage is not always reliably available everywhere across the globe, or bad weather conditions can hinder operations. Thus, just the Office improve, of though. Naval Research, the Naval Surface Warfare Center, and the Army Research Laboratory have all coordinated to develop the first ever artillery-fired smart munition that will not use GPS guidance. Mm. The what project is known as Moving Target Artillery Round, or MTAR for short. What guides them? The MTAR shell can be guided onto stationary as well as moving targets in both land and sea, using a combination of guidance technology. 
work. The best part is that these shells can be fired from the existing M777A2 155mm towed howitzer and the M109A7 Paladin Integrated Management self-propelled 155mm artillery systems already in use by the US military. This seems like the future of warfare to me more than a, like what I was just talking about with the atomic bombs and stuff is precision, right? Precision, you know, so many places, you know, try, <laughs> there's a debate on this of avoiding war crimes, which, you know, uh, can include, uh, uh, like mass, like, like, uh, what do you call it? What's the term for it? When, uh, when you, you punish one group by also punishing another group. What's that term called? You know what I mean? But um, uh, where civilians and stuff can get involved. So that type of retaliation, but it seems like that's the future more than anything is more. Yeah. Destructiveness, but, um, but precision seems to be, I, I think more of the future. The shells will also feature an extended range of 40 to 60 miles using rocket boosters to propel them. Once finished, it will afford the U.S. military another potent weapon system that outclasses others around Those the world. Those look like they're straight up. Lastly, the fifth and final reason yeah, why you shouldn't fight the U.S. military is drones. Um, We're all familiar with what an this unmanned has, this is aerial the vehicle sure. or drone is and what it's supposed to do. But in recent years, the usability of UAVs are steadily increasing to encompass all Maybe spheres of military not. operations and the U.S. military is the pioneering spirit behind it. At first, used only for surveillance missions, drones were quickly weaponized after the 9-11 attacks and have been extensively used by the US military in the war against terror as an offensive weapon platform. So, I mean, they're obviously useful for precision surveillance and stuff, but you can see also so many of these technologies and how technologies are going for is trying to reduce, you know, the, the what's been most of human history, which is um, putting yourself on the line. So taking away foot soldiers and stuff like that so you don't get you know your own casualties so making it third party in a lot of ways using these drones where you can guide it almost like a video game you know but it's about reducing your own casualties but we can also see with that if you don't have it as a precision then you end up um, really potentially not hitting your target or hitting um, bystanders or just innocent people you know it's forecasted that over the next decades, the U.S. is in line to purchase over 1,000 combat drones of various classifications. Some of them, Jeez. like the Lockheed Martin RQ-170 Sentinel and the Boeing MQ-25 Stingray, are already in the final stages of development and Those once drones, finished, that will provide the U.S. military with state-of-the-art platforms capable of multi-role operations, ranging from attack missions to aerial refueling. Drone technology has reached such heights today that a single UAV can loiter miles above the surface of the Earth for hours, waiting for the target to show its head and sticking it, with impunity. It's, it's seriously, it's like it's like warfare is becoming a video game. You know, you sit in the confines of some base, and everything's, you know, done at a distance. Do you think that's going to further dehumanize warfare, where you don't? You're not looking that enemy in the eyes, right? I mean, maybe we've already, maybe we're already past that with the modern technology since industrial revolution for warfare. We've dehumanized that because you're not fighting in close contact and really, really like appreciating that you actually have a person on the other side. Are we going to become so detached and like desensitized as these technologies keep going? What do you think about that too? This capability will allow all the services under the U.S. military to reduce its dependency on manned platforms, yeah, the thereby point. reducing the risks during future combat operations. These five weapon systems make the U.S. military extremely dangerous for Jeez. any adversary looking to get into a conflict with them. Yeah. In a conventional warfare setting, it's almost impossible to beat the U.S. military machine. That's why modern enemies of the United States are employing more and more asymmetric warfare strategies against the mighty U.S. military. Well, this is also going to increase the intelligence war. None of this is useful without proper, accurate intelligence. So intelligence is going to be key. 
right? Uh, encrypting your information and all that stuff. If I had a, a VPN sponsor right now, I'd probably put that in now. But you know what I mean? Uh, protecting your secrets. That's going to be, that's the other line of warfare that is now integrated into all of this. Despite that, the US military juggernaut is hand down the most powerful military complex in the world today and probably will be for decades to come. That's all we have for you today, case. folks. Thanks for sticking around till the end. If you like the video and want to stay up to date on cool military stuff like this, then click the subscribe button and also click the notification bell, and you'll be the first to know the next time we release a video. James Webb Space Telescope found signs of alien life. It's cool. All right, final thoughts. So let me kind of, I guess, summarize everything for a question for you all. What do you, what do you think with the developments that are going on? What is the future of warfare? What do you think it is? How is it going to be done? I guess who's going to use it? What's going to be the goal? What's going to be the end goal? How will you know when you've <laughs> won? And just, yeah, what, what do you think's the future overall? What is the future of warfare going to look like based on this? That's my final question for you. So I asked you guys a bunch of questions down, and I'd love to uh, see your feedback down below about what you all think about this. So definitely let me know. All right, interesting to learn about this stuff um, and, uh, and and to, to, again, get me thinking about this as well and um, get those conversations going. So definitely useful for me. And with that, y'all, we'll see you next time. Bye.